Hi guys, and welcome back. Today, I'm gonna to talk about rhetorical devices and my favorite, top three favorite rhetorical devices. Now, maybe they're not my exactly top three, but it's ones that I really like to use because there are really, there, were, there are a lot of rhetorical devices that are really fabulous and that are a lot more um, creative than just simile and metaphor and hyperbole, okay? So these are ones that are not as commonly known and commonly used um, and I learned them I will give you a hint to how you can better your writing if that's what you're you're looking for I learned them all at Margie Lawson's um, weekend seminar workshop whatever she calls it it's, it's been a while now but she's fabulous at teaching her writers how to really better your craft and she doesn't have like kind of basic advice where it's like oh just read more but it's very specific and concrete and she does a lot more than just teach you rhetorical devices but one of the biggest things that she did was teach me and all of us attending how to use very impactful rhetorical devices a very um, strong that drive the tension up and have a great cadence to your sentence structures. Okay, so here are my top three. After I took this class, I began using them a little more. Now, note to writers: um, some of these are they do include repetitive repetitive phrases or words. So I know that we're often taught to not have re redundancies, repetitive words, that sort of thing. But keep in mind that sometimes the repetition of words is actually done on purpose and it's a rhetorical device. So don't automatically, just because you see something re repeating, assume that it's bad or thoughtless of the writer because I can't count how many times that I was using this, these specific rhetorical devices and I've had beta readers tell me that, you know, highlight the repetition and, and tell me to change it. Um, yeah, that's, you know, so just keep that in mind. And also if you kind of learn a lot of these rhetorical devices, you will recognize them elsewhere and you won't have to actually tell anybody to change them because you'll be like, aha, they're using a rhetorical device. Okay. So one of my favorite rhetorical devices is called anadiplosis. And I love the names of these rhetorical devices. They're really just, they, they sound so foreign and really cool. Okay, so anadiplosis, and I'm gonna read the definition because I don't think I could say it any better without reading it. It is the repeating, it's repeating the last word of one sentence or clause at the beginning of the next sentence or clause. So for example, this is something like, she was mad, mad and afraid. And I, Again, see what I mean about the re rep repeating words? So I love that it, it kind of gives this, um, this punch to the word mad, like if she's really mad, but then she's also afraid or whatever it is, you know, um, it really gives a punch to the whole sentence. And again, this is a very short and choppy sentence. You can do it with something longer as well. Um, but again, I also, I really love the cadence that it gives because of the punchiness and it also raises the tension levels. I love that. So if you see that writers and you're beta reading for somebody, don't automatically ask them to change it because it's actually a good thing. It's, it's a rhetorical device, unless of course it doesn't work or something like that. Okay. So second rhetorical device that I really love is called anaphora. Okay. So anaphora is repeating a word or phrase at the beginning of three or more successes, successive phrases or sentences. Okay, so um, this is again, as you can see, it's repeating words, and I will read you an actual, um, from a classic, an example of an aphora. Um, this is by from A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. And then he goes on to say there are other clauses that say it was, it was, it was. He does it for quite some time, not just three clauses. I think it works really well when there are three clauses. Um, and it just, it kind of, it's, it again gives that punchiness and it emphasizes this tension of wherever you want the reader's attention to go to, right? 
it was this, it was this, it was this. And so it, it, it could be many other words, right? It doesn't have to be, it was, it could be, um, she hadn't thought, she hadn't thought, she hadn't thought, she wanted, she had wanted, she had wanted, something like that. So it's very, um, it's versatile, obviously, with whatever, with many different phrases and words. But again, it kind of, it gives the sentences a punch that it otherwise wouldn't have had. If you just go on a prose of explaining, oh, you know, it was, it was kind of like a good time, but it was also a bad time. And it was also this and that, you know, it just, it makes the sentences and the, I should say, clauses um, a lot, a lot more meaningful and just packs a punch. Okay, I'm gonna keep saying that, packs a punch. <laughs> All right, and the third rhetorical device that I really, really like is um, called a syndeton. Again, fabulous name. So a syndeton is omitting conjunctions in a list of three or more. Now, this is no longer repeating of any phrases or words. This is the omitting of like an and or an or in a list. And I, so we all know that when you're, you're listing more than three of anything, you have to have an and at the very last or an or at the very last um, object or clause in the, in the whole list, right? So, um, and I've also done this purposely in my writing and I've had writers, I can't count how many writers, beta readers would insert an and into a list. Okay. Just because it's omitted an and it doesn't mean it's a mistake. It might be purposely there. If you, and it also, again, this rhetorical device, it packs this, this kind of, it creates this tension in a list. So for example, I'll give you um, and this isn't the greatest example. I was just thinking off the top of my head here. So for example, she took, uh, she took her glasses, her bikini, her bag, her car. And there's kind of like this, um, because you've omitted an and in that last um, clause, you kind, of, you kind of up the tension. Like maybe she left being mad. Maybe, you know, there's, there's something that's happening that is out of the norm because you're not writing in a normal grammatical structure. So it, again, ups, ups the tension in the whole, um, in the sentence. And I, again, urge writers to get familiar with all kinds of rhetorical devices outside of similes and metaphors. I think it makes writing fun. And also when you read other writers writing, you see that they're using whatever rhetorical devices and you don't edit them. And um, yeah, again, with all of these rhetorical devices, it just, the cadence rings really well. If it, of course, if it's done well, you have to also pay attention to maybe the syllables in the sentence to make sure that it's not super drawn out and you've already, by the time you reach the end of one clause, you already forgot what the clause began with. So if it begins, if the next clause begins with the same word, um, you've already forgotten that. Of course, it doesn't work in that way. A lot of these rhetorical devices are used to create more tension and just to create that punch and to give like this rise of emotion out of the reader. Okay, guys. So those are my, I guess, I, I would say my top used rhetorical devices, but there are so many that I love. And I might do another video on some other ones that I really like. And if you guys have any comments, suggestions, if you've used these rhetorical devices, what's your experience with using them? If you guys have anything to say, go ahead and leave me a comment under the video. And please subscribe to my channel. And thanks so much for watching. See you.